What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a new and improved 60 feet 6 inches. I am your host, Kyle Robert. You can follow me on Twitter at NotoriousKRO. With me today from across the pond and on video, it's Ben Ralph. What's up, Ben? Not much, Kyle. Another bike ride today, followed by a, uh, a big meal and a nice um, hearty IPA from a brewery just down the road. I'm uh, This may test me, so if uh, you uh, hear a thud and see me uh, with my face on the keyboard on the video... Again, not Kyle. It's just the amount of things I've done today. <laughs> At least it uh, will be on the second time you've fallen today and, and not the first. So that That's always good. Uh, ben, it is cool to have uh, a little video. We're going to put this up on our YouTube page. Make sure you are checking that out if you can. Fake Pigskins has the official YouTube page. We'll be posting out the link, all that good stuff. Ben, we have a lot to get into, and uh, we actually have breaking news as we were set to record this podcast, the Oakland A's traded Yonder Alonso to the Seattle Mariners. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Alonso and, and his potential in Seattle and, and kind of how does he fit into this lineup? Well, Alonso's definitely sort of tailed off from that kind of that kind of hot patch that he had at the start of the year. Um, it's definitely a concern in that he's clearly not the guy that he was for a period of time. I don't really understand the move from Seattle's point of view because I don't get what what they think they're actually kind of achieving because they're not really challenging this year. And I, I don't see Yonder Alonso as a big multi-year kind of guy for them. It seems an odd move from their point of view. Oakland, I completely understand it. But Seattle, it seems crazy. And, and fantasy-wise, it, it doesn't really boost Alonso's value. He's in a better lineup, I suppose. But there's not a lot to be excited about here. Yeah, I mean, he is playing in a lot of the same parks, which, you know, kind of mitigates that, um, you know, that boost. Obviously, Seattle's a little bit better than Oakland, but not too much. And I think the lineup boost is definitely a thing. Um, I, I do wonder, you know, maybe going in that lineup, getting a little bit, uh, maybe he gets a few more pitches to see. I don't know. I, I think there is a potential for him to kind of get back to closer to what he was. Uh, I am I am interested. I think Seattle's kind of doing a, we'll see guys were going for it. They didn't really give up a ton in terms of a prospect. Um, but you know, I don't know. I, I think there's, put, I think there's, I think it's an interesting move. I think there's uh potential, obviously Alonzo owners should be pretty happy about this move, but, uh, you know, uh, as in terms of the rest of the season value, I'm with you. It, it probably doesn't change too much. Uh, let's talk about Sal Perez. Who's headed to the DL. Uh, he has a strained interco intercostal muscle. Um, Obviously, you know, this was like the number one pros or the number one catcher in fantasy baseball was a big, big, uh, you know, weapon for the Royals, you know, for fantasy owners. Obviously, it, it hurts. But, you know, the, the catcher landscape's been such a mess anyways that I don't know, like, I, I guess it, it, it does hurt. But at the same time, there is some potential, you know, waiver wire ads. If you're uh, if you're if you're a Sal Perez owner. You know, we could talk about Wellington Castillo, his 355, two homers, nine RBIs over the past two weeks. Uh, Christian Vasquez hitting 368 with one homer, one steal, six RBIs. Uh, you know, there. Do you prefer either of uh, either one of those guys over the other? Yeah, it's probably it's probably Beef Wellington to me. I'm just looking at his stats now on the uh, on the other computer and. Um, he, he's the more owned of the two. He's about 50% owned, so you're going you're gonna to struggle to find him readily available. But he's already got 11 home runs on the year. He's hitting 284. Uh, he would be my guy out of those two, but obviously you're limited by your league. Um, like I say, he's owned in 50% of the league, so shallower leagues, you're probably not getting Castillo. Castillo. Yeah. Uh, in, in deeper leagues, Tyler Flowers, Manny Pena, Austin Hedges... Uh, Jorge Alfaro, who got called up and went two for four in his first appearance. Uh, is there a name that kind of stands out above the rest for you if you're looking in, in deeper formats? Alfaro is the one that intrigues me if I can keep him in some formats. Yeah. So if it's a dynasty or a keeper league, Alfaro is my guy. Um, it, it's probably Manny Pena, you know, because um, I, I don't... I don't really know the catching landscape in Milwaukee at the top of my head at the moment, but I know that Vote is on the DL. Yep. Um, they've been sort of umming and ahhing with the Bandies and the Suzaks and those kind of guys. And it, it does seem to me that Pina is the guy there. So I, I think I'd take a gamble on him. He's already got seven home runs on the year. He's hitting 292. He would be probably the guy I'd consider. 
I mean, I've been very impressed with Tyler Flowers this year. I think he's been kind of a kind of a revelation, really, just in terms of what we expected. He's having his best year. Him and um, Suzuki, Kurt Suzuki in Atlanta, both seem to be dovetailing beautifully. So that's a shout. But I think for me, it's Alfaro, if there's some kind of keeper element or if I really want to swing for the fences. And it's Manny Pena, just because I think he's got that balance of a bit of power and a bit of... Um, and, and a decent average. I, I think Tyler Flowers is there as a kind of final backup. I really do. Yeah, I feel like the Brewers have been kind of trying to find their catcher one with Pena being kind of the supplemental piece. And it seems like Manny Pena keeps fighting him off. And the other guys have injuries. And with, for one reason or another, you know, he's kind of their main guy most days. And, uh, you know, you, like you mentioned, they'll, they'll, they'll throw at somebody else just because catchers typically don't play every day. Um, but Pena's been good. I like him. And uh, I think he's... A guy that makes a ton of sense. Uh, let's talk about a couple call-ups. Uh, Ozzy Albies. Uh, talk to me about him and kind of, you know, is he somebody you're you're picking up in fantasy baseball leagues? Um, yeah, I'm kind of intrigued by Albies. I mean, he's probably not a guy I'm, I'm jumping on immediately, but if I've got a messy situation at shortstop or middle infield, like chances are second base has been semi-decent this year. You're probably not sure on them, but... Shortstop is an absolute nightmare at the moment. And if he is shortstop eligible in your leagues, I know he's shortstop eligible on Yahoo, um, then that's definitely a guy I'm looking for. He's hit his first home run already this year. He had nine home runs and 21 steals in 450 plate appearances down in the minors so far this year. He's been really impressive. And um, I, I hope that he can not that he's not going to replicate the kind of Swanson model where he... Um, where he flashes brilliance and then sort of fades the way that Dansby Swanson did this year. Like, I'm really hoping that Albies can stick around. I mean, I, I've kept hold of him in our in our fake pigskin keeper league, and I'm really excited for him to be called up. I've had I've had both my uh, kind of stash guys called up this week, so yeah. it's breathed a new lease of life into my uh, enjoyment of the league. Absolutely, and that, that is what's fun about you know keeper and dynasty formats uh, when you can have a guy like that get called up and you know put him in your lineup and actually see what he can do. Uh, you know, if you're in a league like ours where you can pick up guys off the waiver wire and they kind of become last round keepers, late round keepers, and you're kind of, you know, you're plotting through your typical, you know, average shortstops that are kind of just, you know, older guys or whatever. Um, it, are you are you considering picking up Albies as a guy that, you know, maybe can be a keeper going into next year and, and be a guy that, you know, should be on your team for a couple seasons? Yeah, I think I am. I think Albies is a guy that Atlanta are obviously really excited about him. Um, they, 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 He's going to be a piece there now. I wouldn't be surprised if he sees the rest of the year in the majors. And probably uh, I can see a, him Swanson kind of middle infield to start next year. I think that that's really exciting. I, I don't know if he'll necessarily set the kind of fantasy world on fire. You're looking more from a steals point of view, but... The power in AAA was really nice to see this year. He's definitely a guy I'm adding. He's definitely a guy I'm going to do what I can to keep hold of. Um, or, or if worse comes worse, I'm hoping he has a, a couple of good months now and I can uh, ship him off to someone else at the trade deadline if there's a, if there's a way or, or in the offseason, if there's a way I can't keep him, if that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, let's talk about Reese Hoskins. This is a guy that obviously has power. Um, a guy that can, you know, if he comes up, could be a thing. But, you know, it seems like the Phillies are kind of playing with him, and they have, they're still doing the old, uh, uh, what's what's the what's the Tommy uh, blinking 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 Joseph Tommy Joseph. They're still Tommy doing, Joseph. Yeah, they're still doing that thing. Uh, do you think we see a Reese Hoskins call? I guess, you know, the closer we get to September, the more likely it becomes. Yeah, I think it is. I think I think the real buffering was kind of the uh, trade deadline. Um, they looked to move Tommy Joseph, but he, he's been so bad this year that there just wasn't really any value there. Um, uh, but Reese Hoskins really is banging down the door. I think it'll be interesting to see if they can find a way of working Tommy Joseph and Reese Hoskins in because I don't I don't think Tommy Joseph is done by any means. I think I think this is just a bad bad sort of bad season. Like I don't think they should write him off. But it's whether or not they can work away getting him in at third base or Hoskins in at third base I don't know I hope they can work it out I want to see both of these guys in the Phillies lineup uh, I'm really enjoying watching the Phillies at the moment and if Hoskins gets called up I think that, that really adds to it because there's a lot of interesting names in that lineup and 
if Hoskins can go there and add 20, 25 home runs over the course of a year, perhaps even more as he as he develops, he, he's still a young lad, but as he develops, he, he could be a real great option at first base. I mean, like, he's got some big shoes to fill with Ryan Howard sort of being a main man from there in the past. Yeah, uh, Ryan Howard's a name that kind of gives you a chuckle now, but people forget, like, he was... He had a he had a nice little stretch where he was a really really good uh, power hitter. Um, I do wonder, you know, kind of what it means to the lineup as a whole. I mean, they have Michael Franco. They have some names that they're gonna have. I mean, they can't play all these guys. They have Alan Alessi, Aaron Altair, who just hit the DL. I mean, they're gonna have to kind of mix and match and probably move elite, you know, one or two of them. So it will be interesting to kind of kind of see the direction this organization heads in. Obviously, you know, they've been stacking up these young picks. We're waiting to see them come up and actually do stuff. Uh, obviously, their their pitchers have kind of come along and, and looked better as of late. So, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, let's talk about a couple guys that got sent down. We'll talk. We'll start with my boy Luke Weaver. Um, he he looked incredible against the Brewers. Uh, he went six innings, only allowed five hits, two earned, um, but had eight strikeouts, two walks. Uh, I'm really excited about where he's where he is as a prospect. Obviously, you know, gave up four against the Diamondbacks, but that was really just one one bad inning. Gave the grand slam to J.D. Martinez. Um, for for Weaver, do you think he's kind of a guy that the Cardinals are going to kind of mess with, uh, sending him up and back just to just to have the the you know the the spot on the on the roster um, until it's his turn to pitch, or do you think uh, you know they're just going to kind of find a couple spots where he can be successful? Um, and then kind of have him be a part of the rotation, you know, maybe starting next season. Yeah, I hope they're not going to screw around with him too much because I trouble is, it, I, they, I heard them talking about it on a baseball podcast a couple of weeks ago. It must be so scary being a rookie coming up this year into into the majors because baseball is just crazy at the moment. I mean, it, all this talk about the ball being juiced, the ball is just flying out of the park. Home runs are, are absolute, like, not, I said, well, the premium's not the right word, but there, there's so many home runs at the moment that you, as a pitcher, you've got to be so concerned. And I think the Cardinals are, who are we to question the Cardinals? The Cardinals always seem to get this right. They, they, they know what they're doing with these guys. They tend to hit on most of these prospects. I mean, I know we've got Colton Wong as a, as a recent sort of history kind of piece, but in the past, especially pitching wise, they always seem to look after these guys get them to the to the finish line, so to speak, of their career. And I don't see why Weaver can be any different. I mean, he's been really impressive this year. He, he's flashed g good in his first couple of appearances in the majors. I'm hoping that we're going to see him fairly frequently. And if, if I've got deep enough bench, I'm going to hold on to him for now. Yeah, I mean, I own him everywhere I can possibly keep him. I'm a, I'm a big Weaver guy, and um, I'm really excited about his potential. I mean, if you think about this rotation in you know two or three years, it could be, you know, Alex Reyes, Luke Weaver, Marco Gonzalez, you know, Michael Walk is still hanging on. Like, there, there is a potential for a really, really nice, uh, really solid rotation in St. Louis. They have a lot to be excited about. Uh, my boy Blake Snell, he, he's just, it, it doesn't look like it's going to work so much for him. You know, he got sent down again after getting called back up when he was, you know, in, after getting in, he was sent down for to work on some stuff. It looked like he was good figuring it out got called back up that hasn't been going as well um you know is he kind of getting to the point where maybe he needs a change of scenery he needs uh you know maybe an off season to figure some stuff out or he's just you know not gonna be the the prospect we thought he might be coming up he absolutely needs something uh, i i don't know what the solution is i think um tampa bay are gonna have to sort of stick with him for the time being or at least hope that He's kind of lights out in the minors for the next few months so that they can sort of get some value off him if they do want to trade him. It, it's so tough because in the past, we've always been able to say, OK, the walks are bad, but the strikeouts are there. Mm -hmm. This year, the strikeouts have been there in AAA, but they've not been there in the major leagues. He, he's striking out less than eight batters per nine. He's walking nearly, well, he's walking over five. I mean, that's just... That's just insane. It, it, it's not sustainable. He, he's Every time he's been in the majors for his, his two sort of stints, which now nearly adding up to 200 innings, we're nearly looking at full season's worth of work. And I mean, you shouldn't write a guy off just in one season. If, if this was a guy that had had, I don't know, four seasons in the majors and then all of a sudden he had a 
trying to do maths in my head here, a 160, 170 game kind of stint like like he's had, we might say, okay, he's had a blip, maybe there's an underlying injury problem. So I, I don't think we should write him off, but I, I don't think until we actually see it now, I don't see how you can roster him. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's definitely, like, even in, in keeper and dynasty leagues, he's becoming a guy that is harder to hold on to just because that roster spot is ever so crucial and um, you know, there's new guys that are coming along that are a little more exciting and a little more potential. And, um, you know, I, I'm with you. I'm hoping it ends up being a guy that kind of maybe becomes a post-type sleeper. Maybe he ends up in, you know, Pittsburgh or St. Louis or San Francisco, something like that, where there's a really good pitching coach and kind of works him through some of his kinks and he figures it out. But I don't know. There, there's so much potential there. I just, it, it's hard for him to, you know, prove that consistency, especially at the major league level. Um, let's talk about your boy King Felix, uh, heading to the DL again with tendonitis. I, I love King Felix. I think he had an incredible, um, you know, run as a elite arm, but I, I think that, that those days are long gone. I think, you know, he's kind of become a guy that is going to kind of transition into a back half of the rotation guy, eat up some innings, give up a few earned every time he goes out and, and kind of become that. Uh, are we done with uh, King Felix as a fantasy option? This is going to kill me to say it, but I, I, especially for, for this year, unless we can see late in the year a real clean bill of health, a real lights out King Felix, right now we, we're going to have to look at him as like, I don't know, like how we considered like a light version of Adam Wainwright. So we sort of chatted in the preseason about Adam Wainwright will have his spots where he'll help you. Like, He's a guy to keep on the watch list when he's got a good few starts, maybe that kind of thing. And and sadly, that's the point we've reached with King Felix now. And, and I wish we could have got a little bit longer out of it because he's only he's only 31 years old for, for crying out loud. Like, um, he's got a lot of miles on his arm. I, I just I, I'm just scanning down here and 190 in 2006. I mean, for God's sake, he was pitching in 2006. I was 15 years old. Um, 190 innings in 2006, 190 in 2007, and then a run of 200 plus innings from 2008, 2009, all the way through to 2015, and then even 2016 in a battery through 150. Like this bloke's thrown just thousands of, like, just hundreds of innings. Like, oof. there's no surprise that he's struggling, and I think we've got to just, just give up on him from a fantasy point of view, and it's really sad. Yeah, it's a, it is a bummer. I think you know, to your point about Wainwright, I think you're, he's going to be basically that going forward, where you're going to find matchups against the Angels, or the A's, or you know, some other team where he can be effective. Maybe he gets you seven strikeouts, allows two, um, but for the most part, he's not going to. He's not going to be one of those guys that you can just throw out there and go, "Okay, King Felix, go get it for me." Um, both Jason Kipnis and uh, Zach Kozar were activated for. The game's on Sunday. Uh, let's talk about Jason Kipnis and Zach Kozart, who are both activated for Sunday's games. Um, obviously, you know, nice to have them both back. Guys that were pretty solid, over the, especially over the first half. Um, do you think they're both, you know, solid second baseman that you're kind of throwing right back in your lineup uh, now that they're off the DL? Perhaps not back in the lineup, but if either of them are unowned, I'd definitely be going to get in them. Kozart will have that short stuff eligibility so he will have the bonus where i probably will have to start him if i own him um but for jason kipnis he, he's a bench option there there are better second base options that i'd probably rather have if i could so um that's probably where i stand at the moment like i want to make sure jason kipnis is rostered i don't want him to be sat out there because he is an impact player down the stretch and especially going into fantasy playoffs he, he could have a huge couple of months and really light up your team uh, let's talk about a few trades. And we'll start with the Chicago Cubs, who acquired Alex Avila. Um, obviously, you know, Wilson Cast Wilson Contreras is their, is their catcher one, I think. Um, and, and, you know, obviously he's been crushing eight homers and 27 RBIs in 19 games post the All-Star break. Um, do you think the Avila move was just a depth move and, and to kind of 
have someone in case Contreras needs a day off or, uh, you know, have a little bit of veteran presence behind him for the playoffs and the stretch run? Yeah, I think so. I think they've always had that that kind of stretch, that kind of veteran presence. But they kind of let Montero talk himself out of, out of town in quite quite spectacular fashion in the end. Uh, so they needed somebody. They needed somebody that wasn't going to be a negative with the bat. And I think Avila can be that. He's been hitting 271 this year, 12 home runs. But also just, and this is something for fantasy owners to be aware of coming up to the trade deadline. If you're in a redraft league, like in a dynasty league, don't do anything about this but if you're in a redraft league i might consider selling wilson Contreras. i I mean i know it's tough but if i can get i don't know a catcher and something back for wilson Contreras, i have real concerns that come september the the cubs are on such a tear at the moment that they're probably going to sit in a comfortable position come september and they might consider just sitting wilson Contreras to take some of the stress off his off his body catching we we know is hard. We've seen the attrition rate of catchers. If they can get Alex Avila, a guy they trust behind the plate, maybe one out of every two days or t- um, what two out of every five days, maybe something like that, then I think that's a great way for them to take some pressure off Contreras, allow him to pitch it, maybe even go and stand at first base if they want to give Anthony Rizzo a day off. I, I think they find a way where they can give Contreras some of that time off in the playoffs. He's bit, he shouldered the load this season for them with very little help, and now he's got a Vila. That's just my concern. If I can get, I don't know, a, a sort of a, f- a five through t- ten level catcher and a pitcher to help me in the playoffs, I think I'd do it. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea, um, especially if you're in a league where, you know, Wellington Castillo is just sitting out there. Pick up him, trade Contreras, get, you know, get yourself a pitcher. <laughs> Or, you know, get, get some speed, whatever you need, and, and kind of piecemeal it together. Because I could totally envision a scenario where Avila plays more, especially with Castillo, um, you know, kind of shouldering the load with, you know, in the Montero days and all that good stuff. Uh, let's talk about Jonathan LaCroix. Obviously, his ownership's gone back up since he's become a Colorado Rocky. Um, you know, this is probably the best case scenario if he was getting traded out of Texas. But I, I don't know. Lacroix's been so frustrating to own. Um, you know, is this kind of uh, you know? Do you expect him to kind of return to value and 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 be a legit weapon for fantasy owners, or uh, you know, is this just going to co- you know continue his struggle bus uh, this time in the Rockies? No, I think he'll be fine. I I I would be buying on Jonathan Lacroix. I think I said the same last week when the rumors were that he would be going to the Rockies. I said by Get him on your roster now. Don't don't get caught out, kind of thing. Just to look at the numbers, he's striking out far less than he did last year. His ISO is lower, but maybe that's just a product of a bit of bad luck. The BABIP's a bit lower. I'd really be trying to buy on Luke Roy. I think the BABIP's going to go up playing in Coors. I think even if the power doesn't necessarily return, I think the average will return. I I, I would definitely be buying on Luke Roy. I wouldn't be giving up a huge amount, but Maybe if you're supremely confident, and like you say, Beef Wellington's out on the um, out on the waiver wire. Maybe I consider a I don't know a Contreras for Lucroy plus another close to stud like kind of guy. If that's the kind of deal I can pull, I think I would. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's an interesting target for sure. Uh, let's talk about Tim Beckham. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the Orioles snagged him. Um, you know, it, I guess they were they needed some middle infield help. Jonathan Scope is their everyday second baseman. Uh, Beckham's now homered in three straight games um, after kind of struggling a little bit with the White Sox. You know, is you think this is for real? You think this is a guy that fantasy owners should be adding? I know. Uh, I mean, he's widely available. Fifteen under fifteen percent ESPN, uh, under thirty five percent in Yahoo. Um, you know, are are you going to the waiver wire and adding him if you need a little pop, a little speed? Yeah, absolutely, and I think he wasn't great with the White Sox, but for him, he was he was fairly good. If if that makes sense, that sound that sounds sounds really horrible. But um, he's currently on 15 home runs and five steals for the season. While they might not be career numbers, they are they are decent numbers for him. I, I mean, he, actually, in fact, that is a career number in home runs, um, 15 and steals wise. That's the best he's had now since. 20 or oh, 2013 was in triple a so that's 
these are actually his major league career numbers that he's had this season. So absolutely, I'm going to add him. And if, if he can hit home runs in um, Chicago, he can do it in um, in Baltimore by all means. Yeah, and he's hitting in a much better lineup. Obviously, we'll probably hit pretty low, um, but maybe he sneaks into that you know top two and uh, becomes a guy, especially in DFS, that I'm very very interested in. Uh, let's talk about Pablo. Uh, the Panda is back in the Bay Area. He's officially been called up by the Giants. Um, Brandon Belt got hit in the head with a curveball and uh, is on the seven-day concussion protocol. DL, um, is there any league where you're picking up Pablo Sandoval outside of, like, deep and only leagues? Uh, there's only there's only one person on this podcast that gives a damn about Pablo Sandoval, and that's you, I'm afraid. Um He's just not relevant, is he? Uh, he couldn't hit in Boston, where which was hit a friendly. How's he going to manage it in in um, in San Fran? Like, I know he's going home. I know the surroundings will be more familiar. But outside of uh, outside of the kind of fanboy San Francisco kind of feelings, I I think if you really truly ask yourself this one, Carl, I think you know he he's fairly worthless in any format, even in deep dynasty leagues. Yep. Yeah, I'm not with you. I was. Uh... I am hoping that something ends up working out and kind of regains some of his old form, but yeah, uh, he is not somebody that uh, I am adding. Uh, let's talk about Aaron Judge. Over the past 14 days, hitting 190 with three homers. Um, you know, I guess you know everybody was all over Aaron Judge when he was crushing the ball, and you know the home run derby was incredible, and he's definitely a guy that has that power potential, but you know. Do you think that 280 to 300 is a guy that you know we can expect to see? You know, if you're if you're considering Judge and and keeper in dynasty formats, or or do you think maybe he's a guy that you know you should try and you know say okay I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it this year quote unquote and and sell him off to an owner that's looking to rebuild or maybe you know see what you can get for him is is he a guy you're looking to move or or do you think you know this is just a kind of a blip on the radar and He's not obviously not the guy that he was when the, the start of the season, but you know somewhere in between, hitting 300, but 40-ish home run potential, um, a guy that could be a top, you know, three three to four round pick uh, in fantasy drafts going forward. But there's no harm in trying to sell him, but you have to be getting back a guy who's going to crush you a ton of home runs the rest of the year. You've got to be getting back a guy with absolutely fantastic upside, and really, unless you've got a guy who's been asleep for the last month and a bit i can't see it i mean may uh, march april may and june were fantastic he hit over 300 in each of those months and he hit a combined 27 home runs july he still got seven home runs but he hit 230 and now this month he's hitting 214 um without a single home run that breaks down as 30 in the first half four home runs in the second half like it he he's fallen off to such a point that we knew it was coming. There had to be some regression. Like, there's no way that the guy at the start of this year and the guy at the end of last year could be the same hitter without some form of regression. Mm-hmm. Sadly, we've we've seen that regression. And unless you have a guy in your your league who, who's not paying attention, you're going to really struggle to get the value for Aaron Judge in a keeper league that you probably deserve because he will have spells like this and. He may even be able eventually to do this for a prolonged period of time. So unless you can get absolute nail on value or you absolutely just need a couple of little pieces to tip you over the edge, you, you think that that's the way to win it. I can't see you. Sh- I can't see a way you can shift him right now. Yeah. And he might be a guy that, you know, come come draft time, especially if it's like a you know six man keeper, you could end up trading him to a guy that has a bunch of keepers and kind of get two studs um, instead of judge. But yeah, I think he's not this 190 hitter, but I also don't think he's the. Um, I also don't think he's the, the 330 guy with all those home runs. I think he's kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, let's talk about Danny Salazar, uh, who's been great since rejoining the rotation. 28 Ks, only five walks, and three outings. Um, you know, I know we had Salazar questions. Is he back? Is he kind of. Um, you know the the picture that we used to remember. Well, it would it would look that way, wouldn't it? The way he's um 
he's been pitching so far it's been it's been very impressive i have to say and uh, it's hard not to look at this and be enthused i mean i don't i don't know how many of his innings came late july but july and august have just been absolutely fantastic i mean we've just spoke about a guy who's literally just gone out for any a weekend and just fallen off a cliff and now we're talking about a guy who in the other half seems to have climbed up that cliff and gone from the absolute rock bottom to be what the picture that we know he can be in spurts. The sad thing is that exactly what I said there, the picture we know he can be in spurts. Uh, I, I think you can get something out of him now, but in a month's time, if you're dropping him, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm going to be floating him out there, seeing what I can get on the trade market for him. If I can, if I can get something all well and good, then I'll, I'll sell. If I, if I can't, then I'm just going to ride it out and hope like hell he doesn't fall off at the wrong time this year. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you can find somebody who, you know, is seeing these numbers over the last three starts and going, yep, that's it, he's back, and you can get, you know, kind of that value, uh, I'm willing to trade him, especially if you can get a bat that you need. Uh, but, you know, I'm probably going to hold on to him. Um, and mostly, so I'm a big Salazar guy, and, in, in like, uh, you know, kind of from the jump, I was really disappointed to see how his season kind of fell apart. But uh, it's nice to see him regaining form and, and looking good. Um, yeah, I, I think I think he's back. Um, you kind of hit on this a, a little bit a little while ago, Ben, but I wanted to kind of talk about Joey Gallo as kind of an example of you know with the home run potential of all these players with the, the you know you're talking about the ball you know kind of leaving the park at a at an incredible rate. Guys like Joey Gallo, I mean he's he's got basically he's got 29 home runs on the season, but he's barely hitting 200. You know in previous years guys like Adam Dunn. This was Adam Dunn. He was Adam Dunn. And Adam Dunn was a guy that fantasy owners clamored for because you could pencil in 40 bombs and be really happy with your team. Uh, but now guys like Joey Gallo, you know, they're owned, but not, not all over the place. Um, you know, you're getting power from so many positions that, you know, people aren't really clamoring for those 40 home run guys. Um, is this just a new trend in the in, in baseball and uh, fantasy owners can kind of find home runs so easily that guys like Gallo just aren't worth as much as they used to be? Yeah, that, that's going to be partly it. The other thing that's kind of happened, and it sounds strange, but we spoke a few years ago about, or, or early this year, about kind of this, this whole average sink. And that's what everything's been about, about averages sinking across the major leagues and all of this. But what's kind of happened is averages have, have come together in the middle. Like, they've kind of condensed. So you don't get so many guys at the Adam Dunn level, whereas it felt like five or ten years ago, you, you could sort of you could sort of work out there was going to be five, ten guys that were going to do it. Whereas now you're kind of looking at it going, well, anyone that doesn't hit 230 plus, like, is useless to me. Like, you just have to look at, at the fact that at, almost at Chris Carter, like, he was right on the borderline of useful where he sat which was about 220, 230 average. But Joey Gallo's just, he's so much worse than that. And that is a big issue. Saying that, he's 93rd on the player rater. His home runs and his runs and his RBI and the fact he's got six steals far outweigh the negative that his average get. He's still on the season, a positive sort of around four mark, which to put in, in some sort of context, the best player is Jose Altuve at, 13 and a half with Paul Goldschmidt just below 13. So to put that in, in, in some context, he, he's about that third as good as those guys, but he's still a top 100 player by the player area. So I don't think he's useless, but I think it's format dependent. In a kind of weekly league where you're going to be playing best categories and all that kind of, that kind of jazz, you can afford to punt your average by having Joey Gallo. If what that means is that you're going to win home runs over the course of a year, He's going to win you home runs six or seven times. If that costs you average every week, you have to live with it, don't you? But yeah. that's where his kind of his kind of niche format now is, is that kind of weekly rather than a season-long roto because you just can't afford to have a 206 guy dragging your average down unless you've hit on every single other guy. So if you've got loads of other sort of 280, 300 guys, you can absorb one bad average. But let's say you gambled on Joey Gallo and Jose Peraza at the start of the year, or um, for steals, you made sure you got Billy Hamilton. You're kicking yourself right now because you've lost average on the year. And, it, and in Roro leagues I play, and especially, you need to be scoring 
top five minimum at most of the positions. There's no punting anymore in fantasy as far as I'm concerned. Unless you're going to win six or seven categories, you can't punt anything. So for me, that's the issue here is that Joey Gallup is not bringing enough to me. He's not winning me steals and uh, home runs. If he was doing both of them in this in this sort of day and age of fantasy, that's fine. But he's not, and he, he's costing me, and he's dragging me down in, in a category where I may need three or four points from that category at the end of the year to win me the league, and he might be the reason I don't win it. Yep, and for me, that's exactly why like I'm dropping Gallo from teams that I own him. Um, just because like, the difference between you know those extra five to ten home runs over the course of the season, but, you know, hitting 40 to 60 points lower in terms of batting average, like, that's killing me. Like, I would rather have a guy who hits me 25 home runs and hits 270 than a guy who hits me 40 home runs and is barely hitting at the Mendoza line. Like, in terms of roster construction, in terms of of end-of-season numbers, or even in, like, week-to-week leagues, um, you know, just having that consistency also... Knowing, yeah, okay, the yeah, he has the power potential, but the Rangers could get annoyed with him, you know, getting out all the time and, and you know, basically failing 80% of the time and and not play him as much. And then all of a sudden, you know, those homers take a little bit of a dip, and now you are got a guy with, you know, 35 home runs who's betting, hitting, you know, 190, and that's just killing your fantasy team. Uh, ben- as I've said to you before, it's hilarious. In baseball, you can fail 70% of the time. Um, and and be a successful baseball player, but you fail 80% of the time and you're rubbish. Yeah, yeah, it's really that 10%. That 10% is the make or break. Uh, Let's talk some two-star pitchers before we get out of here, Ben. Uh, Obviously, you know, assuming Max Scherzer is able to join the rotation, which everything points to him uh, doing so, he's obviously your head guy this week. Uh, Dallas Keuchel, Corey Kluber, uh, also headline. Um... I'm looking a little bit farther down, though. Like, uh, you know, I, I like. Uh, I mean. Totally, totally you're saying right. exactly what I'm thinking in that you're saying uh, I'm looking for what I like, trying yeah. to go deeper down the thing. There's just nothing there. And it, it, it's very depressing this week. My full rankings and all my comments are going to be out Sunday night. So it, whenever you're listening to this, just just go and go and look them up and, and see what see what I think. It's a poor week. I mean, last week, I think I was raving about the fact we had something stupid like 20, 30 kind of 14 team potential options this week we're struggling for 20 yeah. i mean like seriously i i'll just give you a sort of an idea jason vargas is sitting in my top 10 mm-hmm. urban santana and trevor cahill they're three guys who had great starts the year but have struggled um zach godley makes it to 12 and it, he's got the dodgers and the and the cubs i mean like that, could that's... you think of a worse couple of combinations than no, that you just awesome. have to look at I was looking at him, and I was like, oh, I like Godley, and then I saw his matchups. I mean, and they're both at home, which you think, oh, okay, you know, a little boost, but he's pitching in that park where, you know, both those teams have so much power potential. He could give up five home runs to each of those teams and and have an awful, awful week. Um, Yeah, I'm with you on Cahill. That's a really, really nice potential. Uh, I mean, outside of, I mean, Chad Cool, Matthew Boyd, Maybe J.C. Ramirez, like I just, it's gonna be, you're gonna really struggle in weekly leagues to to kind of pick and choose a couple extra, you know, uh, you know, two star guys to kind of help fill out your rotation. Yeah, you really are, and I mean, uh, he's just gone on the DL, but we were we were arguing on Friday about the value of a guy like um, Stevenson from the Reds, whether or not. Like whether or not with this this crop of two start pitches you could gamble on him, whether or not you were better off going with um, the devil you know in kind of Matt Garza and Dylan Bundy, or whether Chris Flexen and, and Stevenson, these these two sort of relative unknowns still, are the better way to go. And they're the kind of decisions you're faced with this week. I mean, uh, Brent Brent Suter I think I'd gamble on just because yeah. at Minnesota versus Cincinnati is an interesting one. Ariel Miranda, at least the matchups are nice, but. Dylan Bundy, you know, Dylan Bundy, this is the week that I might start Dylan Bundy because at the Angels at Oakland, I mean, he's he's been rubbish this season. But if he's going to succeed, that's where he's going to succeed. And if he doesn't, you can write him off for the rest of the year. You really can because they are the two parks that I think feasibly are the best parks in the AL to go into and pitch. Again, I'm probably not using him in anything 
shallower than a 14 team league but if I'm really stuck for pitching and I need to win this week bear in mind playoffs are coming up I need to win Dylan Bundy I, I think I'd give it a shot I really yeah. would yeah I think Suter and, and Bundy are two of my favorite guys that are going to be more available they both have nice enough matchups where you could you could you know see them having solid weeks uh, if you're playing DFS this week, Matt Moore is a two-start guy facing the Cubs and facing the uh, Nationals. So load up those pit, load up those hitters against Matt Moore. You will be uh, you'll be very very happy. Um, I, I expect him to give up probably I don't know seven or eight in each of those outings. Um, all right, Ben, this was a lot of fun. It was cool to to get the video going. Uh, we are gonna try and keep doing this throughout the rest of the season. Hopefully helping you uh, reach your playoffs. Uh, if you are listening on the podcast, we thank you for doing that as well. Uh, please rate and review the show on iTunes. Five stars. Leave a review. Let us know what you think. Uh, but until next time, for Ben Rolf, I'm Kyle Robert, and we'll talk to you guys down the road.